All right, everybody, I'm Logan Alec. I'm a CPA. I know I talk a lot about saving money here on the channel, but in this video, I actually want to talk about things you should spend money on. Because when we talk about budgeting, uh, it's usually the conversation usually just revolves around ways to cut expenses, right? Looking for things you spend money on that you don't really need to. But this is an incomplete picture. It isn't always necessarily the case that you should try to avoid spending money at all costs. And in fact, there are some things where I would say that you should fight the impulse to save if you're a natural saver and just go ahead and spend the money because it'll be worth it. In the long run, it might hurt your bank account today, but sometimes you're going to get more uh, value, more out of that expense than just the hit to your bank account today. So let's get right into it. Here are 10 smart ways to spend $100. Number one, Instant Pot. You've probably heard of the Instant Pot. This is like the panacea of budgeting. There are different varieties with different functions. I think the most popular one on Amazon right now you can get for $89. I have a link to it in the description below. So what is an Instant Pot if you don't know? It's a really flexible cooking tool, basically. There are a bunch of slightly different models, uh, but it's basically like a slow cooker, pressure cooker, rice cooker, all wrapped up into one. Now, if you're thinking about it, right, if you have trouble cooking at home, right, and as a result, you eat out or order in a lot, you could easily be spending an extra $100 a month or even a week compared to what you would spend if you were cooking. So an Instant Pot is a perfect tool to get into cooking without the fuss. I don't want to make this a recipe video, but you can make rice, you can make soup, you can even make crock pot dinners, uh, where you just throw everything into the Instant Pot and just wait for it to finish. So even though that initial price tag might sting, if you know you spend too much on food, then you can make that up really quickly just by, uh, you know, doing more eating at home, cooking at home instead of paying way more for food from a restaurant. Number two, new pillows or bedding. Now, just like you may not want to buy an Instant Pot because of the one-time price hit, you might not want to invest in new pillows or new sheets because they cost too much. And your current pillows and sheets are just fine, right? But even though there's not an obvious way to recoup that investment like there is with the Instant Pot, it's still a good idea to invest in your sleep. If you're not getting good quality sleep, that's going to put a drain on everything in your life, your personal life, your work life, your ability to, to produce income, right, and think straight. So if you've been hanging on to your threadbare sheets or your smushed pillow for too long, if you've been thinking that it just isn't worth the money to upgrade or replace, well, if you do have some extra money lying around, then I would say better sleep is one of the best investments you can make. Again, this isn't necessarily something you want to cheap out on. Sometimes you can spend more to get better quality. And if it lasts longer and it's more comfortable, then it's probably going to be worth the cost in the long run. Number three, medical checkups. Obviously, healthcare can be uh, a big problem for many people in the United States. So I just don't want to say, oh, just go to the doctor. I know it isn't always that simple. Um, but a big problem in healthcare is that people avoid getting the help they need because they're worried about the money. In fact, some studies have found that more than half of all Americans do this in any given year, which means they aren't getting the routine care the preventative care, that proactive care they need. And just like not paying for an instant, instant pot might mean that you end up spending hundreds or thousands of extra dollars ordering in or going out, not paying for checkups routinely could mean that you end up having a condition go untreated or unnoticed until it gets worse and you need more invasive, intensive care. So yes, there's a medical risk in not getting proactive checkups, but there's also a financial risk because you might be setting yourself up for even more expensive appointments later on. Again, I know it isn't always that easy. Sometimes you really just can't afford it, and I do appreciate that. But even if nothing is wrong, you should try to get a regular checkup, right? Every year, ideally, maybe two, maybe three, right, at the most. Um, but definitely more often if you're older than 50 or you have any health conditions that you need to monitor. Number four, therapy. This one kind of goes along with medical checkups because it isn't necessarily something that's available to everyone. And mental health care is even uh, less predictable than other forms of health care when it comes to getting insurance coverage. So again, I understand this can be a challenge. Uh, $100 might not be enough to cover uh, ongoing therapy or even one session of therapy. And it's unfortunate that it can be so difficult to get mental health care. But I want to emphasize that uh, financial aid is often available. Um, lots of therapists offer payment plans, sliding scales, etc. And you may uh, also be able to at least get some coverage through your health insurance if you're insured. But if you're struggling with your mental health, then you do deserve to get the help you need. And I would highly recommend reaching out to some therapists in your area for more information about working that into your budget. Number five, premium credit cards. Now, premium credit cards aren't for everybody. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everyone should just go out right now and, and apply for a, a nice credit card and spend $100 on the annual fee. But last year, I put out a video on credit card myths. There is a link to that video at the top of the screen right here, as well as in the description below. 
And one of the most common myths I hear is that premium credit cards are a ripoff. They're a scam. They're not worth it. Now, some are, don't get me wrong, right? And of course, each card is different. But a lot of the paid cards, ones with an annual fee, they come with perks that you wouldn't be able to get with a free card. Ultimately, whether or not the benefits of a particular card are worth the annual fee is going to come down to your situation. But if you're consistent about paying your bill on time and avoiding interest and late fees, etc., then you might be able to come out ahead with a premium card. So if you're looking for a new credit card, again, you shouldn't necessarily get one with an annual fee. That's not best in all circumstances, right? It really depends on the situation, but you also shouldn't rule out a card just because it has an annual fee. Also in the description below, I have links to some of my reviews of some of my favorite credit cards with a low or no annual fee. Number six, budgeting apps and subscriptions. Some people are able to budget just fine on their own. Other people swear by one specific platform. So just like with premium credit cards, you kind of have to figure out what makes sense for you. But there are a lot of paid budgeting services that offer some really cool features and you'll be happy you put some cash down up front when you end up saving a lot more than you spent over the course of a month or a year. For example, you need a budget, YNAB, provides a 34 day free trial. And if you're getting a lot out of it, you can keep your subscription alive for either $11.99 per month or $84 per year. $84 for budgeting might sound like a lot, and obviously you shouldn't spend that money unless it's really working for you. But if you find a budgeting platform that works for you, I wouldn't hesitate to pay $5 or $10 per month for access to that service if it can save you $50, $100 a month in your budgeting. Number seven, a gym membership. Personally, I'm more productive when I'm in the habit of exercising. I know I'm getting a lot more done. I feel better throughout the day, and I also tend to get better sleep. Of course, there are a lot of additional benefits that come from regular exercise. You don't need me to tell you that working out is good for your body. I'm not a doctor or anything like that, uh, but you can read the research for yourself, and it's also good for your mind. Now, you don't need a gym membership to get some exercise. Maybe you want to just take a jog in your neighborhood. Well, you can pick up a, a decent pair of running shoes for less than $100, uh, and if running isn't your thing, $100 will also go a long way towards some basic equipment if you want to set up a home gym. So the point is that uh, whatever kind of exercise works for you, you should go ahead and invest in the equipment or the membership you need to make that happen and fit a workout into your daily routine. The trick is to actually make it a part of your routine, daily or weekly routine. Otherwise, it's just money down the drain. Number eight, a modem. If you own your own place, and you're probably wondering what I'm talking about, but if you're a renter, then you might be familiar with these companies that give you the option to either use your own modem or get one from them for an extra monthly or annual payment. That might only be $5 or $10 per month. Okay, that doesn't seem so bad on its face, but at the same time, you can easily buy a decent modem yourself for less than $100. So let's say it costs $5 per month to rent your modem. Well, after two years of that, you'll have spent $120 on your modem and you can't even keep it. So in many situations, I think it makes sense to go ahead and buy your own modem. That way you'll also be able to shop around and compare models and you won't have to pay any ongoing fees to use someone else's modem. Number nine, renter's insurance. This is another one for all the renters watching out there. I know you might be rolling your eyes, but the truth is that renter's insurance is a tiny, tiny price to pay to be covered for anything that might happen to your stuff or even your apartment. There's no official statistic for the average cost of renter's insurance. I can't say exactly how much you have to pay for your specific place and your specific stuff and your specific location, but in most cases, it should be somewhere between maybe $10, maybe even less, maybe 10 to 25 a month, depending on where you live, what kind of policy you have, what's in your apartment, etc. Obviously, I hope you never need your renter's insurance policy. And in most cases, to be honest, you probably won't. But personally, I don't think it's risk worth, uh, it's worth risking everything in your apartment just to save $10, $20, $30 per month. If you're looking for a renter's insurance company, be sure to check out Lemonade. My link to Lemonade is in the description below. They can give you a free quote. Number 10, coffee equipment. If you don't drink coffee, then you're saving yourself a lot of money. But if you're one of those people who can't do without it, then you should at least make it yourself some of the time. Going out for coffee will end up being something like three or four times the price. And honestly, in most cases, you'll be getting a product that's not even as good as what you could have brewed at home. Some coffee equipment is gonna run well over $100, especially things like high quality grinders, espresso machines, etc. But you can get some decent gear even on a relatively limited budget. And if you're drinking coffee every day, then it won't take you much time at all to make up the money you would have spent going to the cafe and spending two bucks or three bucks plus tip for a mediocre cup. All right, everyone, that's all I have for you today. I know the focus when it comes to budgeting uh, is usually on saving money and not spending money, uh, but hopefully this video gave you some good ideas on how to spend your money wisely in a way that's more beneficial to your health, your lifestyle, 
and even your long-term finances. Now, I was only able to cover 10 items in this video. I'm sure there are a lot more great ideas out there. So if you know of any good ways to spend $100, please leave a comment below for the other viewers and for me as well, since I'm always looking for new budgeting ideas. As always, I wanna thank everyone for watching this video to the end, right here and right here. I have some other great videos on saving money that will help out with your budget. And I'll see you over in those videos. Bye-bye.